Hello YouTube, in this video I'm going to outline the frege geech problem in metaethics. The frege geech problem is a central challenge to non-cognitivism. Uh, I have covered non-cognitivism in my series on metaethics, but um, I'll say a little bit about what the view is here. So, uh, non-cognitivism is a claim about the meaning of moral judgments. Um, according to non-cognitivists, moral judgments do not express beliefs. Uh, when we make moral judgments, we're not really even attempting to describe properties in the world. What exactly are we doing? Well, different non-cognitivists will say different things. Uh, so, we might say that moral judgments are expressions of emotional attitudes. They're expressions of approval or disapproval. So, stealing is wrong means something like boo to stealing. Or we might say that moral judgments are expressions of commands. So, stealing is wrong means something like, don't steal. Um, I mean, a useful way to think about this is in terms of direction of fit. Beliefs have a mind-to-world direction of fit. When I hold a belief, I aim to match my state of mind to the way the world is independently of me. The mind aims to fit the world, right? Like, I believe all humans are mortal. There's a state of affairs in the world, I'm representing that state. By contrast, consider desires. Desires have a world-to-mind direction of fit. When I have a desire, I aim to make the world a particular way. So, I may desire to be a millionaire. Um, I don't believe I'm a millionaire, but I would prefer things to be different. The desire motivates me to shape the world in the direction of the representation I have in mind. So, according to non-cognitivists, moral judgments are really more like desires than they are like beliefs. Moral judgments have a world-to-mind direction of fit. Now, <clears throat> moral judgments obviously seem to be straightforward descriptive claims, right? When I say that stealing is wrong, I seem to be predicating a property of an action, just like stealing is illegal predicates a property of an action. But non-cognitivists will say that this surface form of moral judgments is misleading. Uh, so, actually, stealing is wrong... It means something more like boo to stealing, and the goal is not to represent the way the world is. It's not to, you know, represent that stealing has the property of wrongness. Rather, the goal is to make the world a particular way. Make it so that it contains no stealing. All right, so that's the basic idea of non-cognitivism, and this is a very influential approach in, in metaethics. As I said, if you want more detail on how this works and why people might believe this, you can check out my uh, earlier videos on it. But almost from the beginning, non-cognitivism has faced a very serious problem. Uh, many philosophers consider this to be a knockdown objection to non-cognitivism, and much of the literature about non-cognitivism has focused on addressing this problem. This is the frege geech problem. So basically, the frege geech problem is, how do we explain the meaning of moral sentences when they are in unasserted contexts? Okay, so, very often we will use sentences without asserting them. Consider, for instance, all humans are mortal. I can assert the claim that all humans are mortal, right? I can, I can affirm the belief that all humans are mortal, so I might just say, all humans are mortal, and then that asserts the claim. But I can use this same sentence in many other contexts. I can say, I wonder whether all humans are mortal or Frank hates that all humans are mortal, or if all humans are mortal, then I'm going to die. And I can say all of these things, even if I don't believe that all humans are mortal, right? When I, like, when I say these sentences, I'm not actually asserting that all humans are mortal. So maybe, for instance, I believe that the technological singularity is going to occur and mortality will be cured. People will live forever in bodies constantly repaired by nanobots. But I can still recognise, for instance, that if all humans are mortal, then I'm going to die. Yeah, because I'm a human, right? So I can work that out, even if I myself don't believe that all humans are mortal. Now, the key point to notice here is that all humans are mortal means the same thing in these different contexts. It expresses the same proposition, regardless of whether that proposition is asserted. So when I say all humans are mortal, or when I say if all humans are mortal, then I'm going to die, that sent the, the part, all humans are mortal, has the same meaning in each of those cases. So Frege distinguishes between 
the force of a sentence and the content of a sentence. Essentially, the content of a sentence is the meaning of the sentence. It's the proposition expressed by the sentence. The force of the sentence is what the sentence is used to do. It's the, the attitude that we have to the content. So, like, I can affirm the content, or I can inquire about the content, or I can, like, you know, I can, I can, I can do these different things with the same content. Now, because the content of a sentence remains the same in asserted and unasserted contexts, uh, language has an important feature known as compositionality. Basically, the meaning of a more complex sentence is a function of the meaning of its parts. We can build up endlessly complex sentences from simple parts. So take, for instance, grass is green, right? Well, I can, I can also say grass is green and snow is white. Or if grass is green and snow is white, then the cat is on the mat. Or if grass is green and snow is white, then the cat is on the mat and all humans are mortal, right? Blah, blah, blah. I, and I can just do this indefinitely. I can extend this indefinitely, provided I understand the atomic sentences. So provided I understand sentences like grass is green and the cat is on the mat, and provided I understand these logical operators, you know, the conjunction, the conditional. Well, in that case, I can understand sentences of any arbitrary complexity. So this is just a sort of a general important feature of, uh, of, of language. So now let's turn to moral sentences, right? Well, similarly, it seems that moral sentences can be used in unasserted contexts. So I may say stealing is wrong. I may assert that stealing is wrong. Or I may say, I wonder whether stealing is wrong. Or my parents told me that stealing is wrong. Um, or, you know, if stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. So we can use these moral sentences in unasserted contexts, and it looks like stealing is wrong has the same meaning, whether it's being asserted or unasserted. Similarly, moral language is compositional in that the meaning of complex sentences containing moral terms is a function of the meaning of their parts. And I can, I can just generate arbitrarily complex uh, sentences containing moral terms you know, if stealing is wrong and lying is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong and paying somebody to lie is wrong. And, and, and like, blah, you know, I could just, I can just extend that indefinitely. And, and we understand the meaning of that complex sentence by understanding the meaning of its parts. Now, let's suppose that moral judgments are merely expressions of attitudes of approval and disapproval. So stealing is wrong means nothing more than boo to stealing. Well, the problem is that in all the cases that I've listed here, stealing is wrong is clearly not being used to express a negative attitude towards stealing. So when I say, I wonder whether stealing is wrong, that doesn't express disapproval of stealing. Or when I say, if stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. Again, I'm I, I'm not I'm not expressing disapproval of stealing there. Um, I'm not asserting that stealing is wrong. I'm I'm saying something about what would follow if it were wrong. But I don't I don't myself have to believe that stealing. Maybe I'm totally cool with stealing. But I just think you know if stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. Sure. But I myself I have no problem with stealing. You could have that attitude, right? So one way to put this challenge is how do we explain the meaning of moral sentences when those sentences are embedded in more complex sentences? So sometimes it's called the embedding problem, right? You'll sometimes hear uh, the, the Frege Geach problem called the embedding problem, right? So those are the same, the same problems, right? How do we account for the meaning of moral sentences when those sentences are embedded in more complex sentences? Um, of course, in principle, actually, it's worth noting that this problem arises even for unembedded sentences, because I, I might utter stealing is wrong sarcastically, um, in which case it would presumably not uh, uh, express a, a disapproval of stealing, right? Um, but any, anyway, uh, recall Frege's distinction between force and content. Uh, the trouble for the non-cognitivist is that, on their view, the force just is the content. Um, but when, 
moral sentences are used in unasserted contexts. They're not being used with the ordinary force, right? They're not being used to uh, to make moral assertions. They're not being used to e express anything. So <clears throat> here we can we can kind of put the, the challenge in this way. It seems that stealing is wrong has the same meaning when it is used in complex sentences. But stealing is wrong when used in complex sentences does not express an attitude of disapproval towards stealing. So the meaning of stealing is wrong is not the attitude that it is used or sometimes used to express. And this problem is going to arise no matter what the non-cognitivist takes the meaning of moral sentences to be. When I say I wonder whether stealing is wrong. Clearly I'm not, you know, commanding anybody to steal, right? I'm, I'm not saying boo to stealing. I'm not, I'm not doing any of those things. So this is the Frege Geach problem. Now, there's, there's another important aspect to this problem, um, which is that it's hard to see how the non-cognitivist can make sense of moral arguments. So consider the following argument. If stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. Stealing is wrong, therefore paying somebody to steal is wrong. Well, prima facie, this is a straightforward application of modus ponens. And, you know, this is exactly the kind of argument you might find a moral philosopher or even a lay person making in defense of their moral views. So any adequate theory of moral language needs to make sense of this, at least. But on the non-cognitivist view, stealing is wrong in premise two expresses disapproval of stealing. So stealing is wrong in premise two is like boo to stealing. Um, but if you, in premise one, right, if stealing is wrong, paying somebody to steal is wrong. Well, stealing is wrong does not express disapproval of stealing there. So these uses of stealing is wrong in premise one and premise two, these mean different things which means that the argument is just a, you know, it's a fallacy of equivocation. It's like if I was to say, if the bank is next to the cinema, the bank is two minutes walk from here. The bank is next to the cinema, therefore the bank is two minutes walk from here. But then suppose that in using the word bank in premise one, I mean financial institution. And in by using the word bank in premise two, I mean river bank. Well, then the argument's no longer valid. It's no longer a genuine application of modus ponens. So this brings out another dimension to the phrase of each challenge, which is, even if the non-cognitivist can make sense of, you know, the meaning of moral sentences when they're used in complex constructions, this meaning needs to be such as to validate certain inferences. It needs to be such as to, you know, validate this kind of use of modus ponens. Um, more precisely, uh, as Mark Schroeder puts it in his uh, book, Non-Cognitivism in Ethics, there are two points here that are in need of explanation. So first there is the inconsistency property. If I accept both premises of a valid argument, but reject the conclusion, I am being inconsistent. Right? There, is, there is some logical mistake. Um, and of course, that pressures me to change my views to, re to restore consistency. Second, uh, arguments license inferences. So given that you accept premise one and premise two, you ought to accept the conclusion. Um, you, you can't just shrug and say you don't care about it. So even if you don't actively, you know, you might say, well, look, I don't actively reject the conclusion, right? I just, you know, I suspend judgment or something, right? Well, no, even that's not good enough, right? Once you accept premise one and premise two, given that the argument's valid, right, you, you have to accept the conclusion. Now, you know, if you're a cognitivist, you're going to have an easy time with this because accepting the premises and rejecting the conclusion is inconsistent because it would involve holding beliefs that cannot jointly be true. Um, accepting the premises licenses the conclusion because the premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion, right? If the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. So, you know, once you accept the premises, you've got to accept the conclusion. That's what a cognitivist will say. So the challenge for non-cognitivism is to show how the meaning of a complex sentence containing a moral sentence is determined by the meaning of its parts. And then this account is also going to have to preserve the inconsistency property and the inference licensing property. You know, we need to show, like, why is it that somebody who accepts premises one and two of the, of the previous argument is compelled to accept the conclusion? So as Mark Schroeder puts it, what the non-cognitivist needs is a recipe which, and I quote, 
tells us how to determine the meaning of a complex sentence on the basis of the meaning of its parts. And then again, you know, we need to account for the use of these sentences in arguments as well. Now, in answering the frege geach problem, many non-cognitivists have sort of started with the case of arguments. They've attempted to show how non-cognitivism can make sense of moral arguments. Um, but again, it's worth keeping in mind that that's not the whole problem. Um, so, with that said, let's consider some of these responses. Let's take a look at what non-cognitivists have said about this. Well, one early response was given by uh, R. M. Hare. Hare didn't attempt to solve the problem directly. Uh, rather, he gave an argument for optimism that the problem could be solved. He tried to give us a license for optimism. So what Hare points out is that there are uncontroversial cases of non-cognitive sentences that embed into more complex sentences and retain their meaning. Uh, so in particular, Hare focused on imperatives, sentences that express commands. Consider shut the door. Well, clearly, shut the door does not express a proposition that could be true or false. Shut the door does not describe the world. It issues a command. And so this sentence is clearly non-cognitive. Non -cognitive. This has a world to mind direction of fit. Right. Ev everybody would accept that. Pretty much everybody. <laughs> um, now, we can use imperatives in unasserted contexts. So I can say, if it gets too cold, then shut the door. So the imperative is embedded in a conditional. Um, and the meaning of this more complex sentence containing the imperative is a function of the meaning of its parts. Um, and it looks like we can kind of create endlessly complex conjunctions or endlessly complex sentences like this. So I can say, you know, if Verity comes home, then shut the door and close the blinds. Um, maybe even maybe even arguments. So like, if it's too cold, shut the door. It's too cold, so shut the door, right? So we saw that one aspect of the frege Geach problem is capturing the inconsistency property. Um, now imperatives, you know, we don't we don't sort of usually make like formal arguments with them. Maybe there's some sense in which we can make arguments, but there is for imperatives some sense in which they can be inconsistent. So shut the door is contradicted by don't shut the door. These express different commands which cannot simultaneously be realized. Um, so anyway, imperatives are uncontroversially non-cognitivist. But they, they retain the same meaning in unasserted contexts, they are compositional, they can be inconsistent with each other. So there must, for such imperatives, be some non-cognitivist theory that accounts for these features. And if we can have a non-cognitivist theory of meaning in this case, this gives us a reason to be optimistic that a non-cognitivist theory of meaning could work for moral sentences. We may not yet know exactly how this theory works, but we can be optimistic that there is such a theory. Now, with that said, this optimism has limits. Um, there are numerous constructions that don't make sense for imperatives. Uh, so consider, if shut the door, then it's getting cold. That's just ungrammatical. So I can say, if it's getting cold, then shut the door. But I can't say, if shut the door, then it's getting cold. Um, if shut the door, then close the mind, close the blinds. Doesn't make any sense, right? Um, <clears throat> and, or try putting that into an argument. If shut the door, then it's getting cold. Shut the door, therefore it's getting cold. Yeah, this, this just doesn't make any sense at all. By contrast, the, the sort of moral analogue of these statements is perfectly fine. Uh, so, you know, replace the imperative here with a moral sentence, right? If stealing is wrong, so moral sentence, then stealing is fun. If stealing is wrong, then stealing is fun. That's fine. If stealing is wrong, then murder is wrong. That's fine. It's grammatically perfectly fine. Um, so we can't simply assume that whatever theory of meaning works for the explicit imperatives can just be carried over to moral sentences. Like, Hare gives us some, you know, some license for optimism. He's saying, well, you know, there are these cases of uncontroversially non-cognitive sentences where <clears throat> they do embed in some more complex sentences right, where they can be said to be inconsistent with each other, where, you know, there is this feature of compositionality. Fair enough. 
But, you know, we, we're going to want to hear more in the case of m m moral sentences, because uh, we can't just assume that whatever theory of meaning works for the imperative is going to work for moral sentences. In fact, it's clear that that won't work, right? Whatever theory of meaning works for imperatives isn't going to work for moral sentences, because there are uh, there are uses of moral sentences that just would clearly be like straightforwardly ungrammatical when it comes to imperatives. Right, well, I just want to do a quick advert now. I... I have a Patreon. If you like my channel, you can sign up to the Patreon where I will be uploading uh, bonus content. I have plenty of videos already on there. So, uh, you know, if you just sign up to the £5 a month tier, that's all it takes. You get access to lots of bonus videos. Or you could just, you know, throw me some cash on PayPal. And I do really appreciate, uh, you know, whatever, whatever people can throw my way. I mean, the channel takes... You know, it takes it, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to put these videos together. So uh, if you can support me, I really appreciate that. I also offer private tutoring in philosophy. Send me an email if you're interested in that. And uh, you can also join the Discord if you want to talk about <coughs> any of these topics. Um, okay, then. Let's move on. Um, all right. One of the most uh, influential proposals for solving the frege geach problem is Simon Blackburn's higher order attitudes account. Um, the presentation I'm going to give here is slightly different from Blackburn's original, but not in a way that, you know, alters things <laughs> problematically. Um, I'm slightly simplifying a few things. So, <clears throat> um, okay, so we're thinking about, you know, again, like an, an argument, right? Like if stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. Stealing is wrong, therefore paying somebody to steal is wrong. And and you know, we we need to exp we want to explain like how can a non cognitivist make sense of this? Well, I mean, really, what's what's problematic here is the conditional uh, the conditional claim. Um, what is being expressed by if stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong? Well, what Blackburn says is we have to understand this as expressing an attitude about attitudes. So a higher order attitude. So we have attitudes not just towards actions, we also have attitudes towards attitudes. For instance, I disapprove of slavery. That's an attitude towards an action. But I also disapprove of approval of slavery. So if somebody approves of slavery, if somebody says that slavery is good, I will judge them negatively. I consider that to be a repugnant attitude. So this is a higher order attitude. It is an attitude about an attitude. So we can kind of put this, I mean, you know, Blackburn introduces this convention where like, you know, we can for, we can symbolize, right, like a hooray operator and a boo operator. So the B with the exclamation mark, that's boo. And H with an exclamation mark is hooray. Uh, so we have boo to slavery, right? Boo to slavery. And so, you know, this is on a non-cognitivist view, this is what's expressed by slavery is wrong. Um, or we can have hooray to slavery. But, you know, you don't want to say hooray to slavery, right? Hooray to slavery is an attitude that I consider repugnant. So I will, I, my attitude can be represented as boo to hooray to slavery. Um, so that's a higher order attitude. Now, according to Blackburn, conditionals work in kind of a similar way. They're higher order attitudes. So if stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. This expresses a higher order attitude. It expresses disapproval towards the state of disapproving of stealing while not disapproving of paying somebody to steal. So we can express it so, sort of like this, right? We have boo to, then open brackets, boo to stealing and not boo to paying somebody to steal, close brackets, right? So we're, we have boo to stealing and not boo to paying somebody to steal, that whole combination of states, I'm booing that when I, when, I, when I say this conditional, if stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. And, and hopefully you can kind of see how that works, right? Because I'm, I'm sort of saying, well, when I say if stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. What I'm saying is, is like, you know, anybody committed to stealing is wrong has to be committed to paying somebody to thinking that paying somebody to steal is wrong. <clears throat> right? Stealing is wrong entails that paying somebody to steal is wrong. 
So the way Blackburn reframes this is, well, okay, the attitude boo to stealing, right? If, if you have that attitude, boo to stealing, then you must also have the attitude of boo to paying somebody to steal. So if stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. That's boo to boo to stealing and not boo to paying somebody to steal. <clears throat> or similarly, right? If it's okay to drink alcohol, it's okay to smoke cannabis. This expresses disapproval towards the state of approving of drinking alcohol while not approving of smoking cannabis. So this is boo to hooray to drinking alcohol and not hooray to drinking to smoking cannabis. <clears throat> or something like that. Um, and again, you know, hopefully you can see like that because what's being said when I say if it's okay to drink alcohol, it's okay to smoke cannabis. I'm saying, well, like thinking it's okay to drink alcohol commits you to thinking it's okay to smoke cannabis. Thinking it's okay to, like, alcohol's fine, entails cannabis is fine. So that's kind of the thing. So, so like, I'm booing the combination of somebody hooraying drinking alcohol and not hooraying smoking cannabis. Now, once we have this, you know, this, this in place, right, we now have a kind of recipe that allows us to account for the compositionality of at least some of our language, right? We can now determine for any conditional, uh, at least any conditional containing moral terms, we can determine the meaning of that conditional on the basis of knowing the meaning of its parts, right? So, so if P then Q, right, I can use Blackburn's recipe to, as long as I know the, the meaning of P and the meaning of Q, I can use Blackburn's recipe to work out exactly what state of mind is expressed by this conditional. And this is going to work across the board for all conditionals. Um, so basically, I'm, it's boo to, so if I say if P then Q, it's boo to P and not Q. And then the P and the, the not Q are understood, again, in terms of hooraying or booing. And so we now have, like, again, this is a, this is a recipe that's just going to work no matter, no matter what conditional we're dealing with, no matter how complex it is, right? Because you could, you know, you could, right, if... P and Q and R, then S and T, and you can easily see how that would that would fit into this uh, this account, right? I can I can boo stealing and boo murder and boo such and such, right? Okay, so with this in mind, then let's take a look at, at this toy moral argument. If stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. Stealing is wrong. Therefore, paying somebody to steal is wrong. On Blackburn's analysis, we translate this as follows. Boo to, boo to stealing and not boo to paying somebody to steal. That's premise one. Then premise two is boo to stealing. And then the, we have the conclusion, boo to paying somebody to steal. So hopefully you can see why this is an appealing account of, of what's going on here. So suppose you endorse the premises of this argument, right? Let, I mean, take Blackburn's translation, right? So suppose you endorse these, you have the attitudes expressed in those first two premises. Um, so so you, 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 you boo to boo to stealing and not boo to paying somebody to steal, and you boo to stealing. So you have the attitudes expressed in those first two premises. Um, well, if you do not then also endorse the conclusion if you do not boo paying somebody to steal what that means is is that you have a combination of attitudes of which you yourself disapprove because premise one like it so by endorsing premise one you disapprove of sensibilities that combine disapproval of stealing with failing to disapprove of paying somebody to steal per premise two you disapprove of stealing so if you don't also disapprove of paying somebody to steal, you disapprove of your own attitudes. As Blackburn puts it, you would have a fractured sensibility. And and so uh, Blackburn says, this is a problem not, and I quote, because such a sensibility must be out of line with the moral facts it is trying to describe, but because such a sensibility cannot fulfill the practical purposes for which we evaluate things. Um, so this licenses the inference 
from the premises to the conclusion in the case of a modus ponens argument. Um, I like I don't want to be in a state of mind that I myself disapprove of. Uh, I mean, of course not. Um, there is a kind of irrationality here, right? Like if I if I hold a state of mind that I myself disapprove of, I'm clearly going to be under pressure to change something. Now, of course, this account is, you know, limited. It's not an account of all sentences, but it does allow us to capture at least some moral arguments. And it, you know, it points the way for the non-cognitivist. It gives us a concrete idea of what a non-cognitivist theory of meaning might look like. Um, and so, you know, and, and it, again, you know, it captures the features of like, OK, it allows us to embed moral sentences. It, it allows us to account for compositionality, right, for the fact that we can generate these more and more arbitrarily complex sentences out of simpler parts. Um, and it, it also shows us how certain inferences are valid, right? Like once you accept the premises, you are you are under pressure to accept the conclusion. With that said, let's turn to some objections to the higher order attitude account. So first of all, we saw that one part of the frege geach problem is that the non-cognitivist needs to capture inconsistency, right? There is something inconsistent about accepting premises one and two, but then rejecting the conclusion. So what exactly is the problem with having a fractured sensibility, with having attitudes that you yourself disapprove of? Well, the worry is that this appears to be merely a practical failing or a moral failing. There's not, strictly speaking, any logical inconsistency here. I mean, what would we say to somebody who just sort of shrugs and says, well, you know, I don't mind having a fractured sensibility. In, in fact, maybe there's even something appealing about having a fractured sensibility. Uh, maybe a fractured sensibility is more bohemian, more artistic. Uh, it's not entirely obvious that there's any error at all in having a fractured sensibility. So, you know, what we can say is, look, if you accept the premises but reject the conclusion, then, OK, you're doing something that you yourself disapprove of. You have an attitude that you yourself disapprove of. So you're a hypocrite. But, I mean, there's nothing unusual about a hypocrite, right? Um, consider the person who morally disapproves of eating meat that eats meat anyway. Uh, well, OK, that's hypocrisy between, you know, that, that the conflict there is between attitude and action. Um, in that case, it doesn't seem like that's logical inconsistency, right? It's not like... There's, there's some sort of contradiction uh, in disapproving of eating meat, but then eating meat anyway. I mean, that's just, you know, that's not a contradiction. That's just weakness of the will. Um, now, obviously, in the case of uh, Blackburn's account, the hypocrisy would be at the level of attitudes alone, rather than a conflict between attitude and action. But it's still, you might think, no, this is kind of a stretch to equate this with logical inconsistency. All right, so what could we say in response? So, I mean, one point, of course, is just that, you know, in some sense, we can't be demanding that the non-cognitivist say exactly what a cognitivist would say about inconsistency. Um, I mean, so, I mean, in some sense, it's like, well, of course, on the non-cognitivist view, there's not going to be, like, logical inconsistency, strictly speaking. Um that would be an unreasonable demand, given that they're explicitly rejecting cognitivism. They're explicitly rejecting that, that, that moral sentences are supposed to be understood in terms of, you know, beliefs. But let's consider how inconsistency works in the case of beliefs, right? Under what conditions are two beliefs inconsistent? Well, just when the truth of one rules out the truth of the other. So if one is true, the other must be false. And this is a problem given that beliefs have a mind-to-world direction of fit. I aim to believe what's true and disbelieve what's false. If I have inconsistent beliefs, the truth of one rules out the truth of the other. Um, so I can't be just believing what's true and disbelieving what's false if I have inconsistent beliefs. Now, we can extend something like this notion of inconsistency to desires. We can say that two desires are inconsistent just in case they cannot both be satisfied. Satisfying one desire rules out satisfying the other. Desires, of course, have a world-to-mind direction of fit. If the world cannot be such as to jointly satisfy both desires, that's clearly a problem. And, you know, it's a problem for moral judgments too. Moral language has a practical function. It guides our actions. It tells us what to do. This guidance is going wrong if we're being told to realise incompatible states of affairs. 
So the claim is, no, oh, you know, this higher order attitudes account, um, it can give us as, you know, robust a sense of inconsistency as the non-cognitivist would want to give us anyway. Um, so that might be the response there. Perhaps a more serious challenge is that the higher order attitudes account runs into some trouble when it comes to mixed conditionals, a conditional where only one part of it is a moral sentence. So here's an example from Schroeder. Um, if being friendly is wrong, then my parents lied to me. So how do we apply Blackburn's recipe to this kind of case? So I might try, so we, 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 we know how to at least start it, right? Boo to, boo to being friendly and Hmm. Well, what goes in here? Because when it comes to the consequent, right, my parents lied to me. Well, that's just a straightforward, you know, indicative claim. Um, we're not hooraying or booing anything there. That's not an expression. If I just say my parents lied to me, that's not an expression of attitude. Um, I might, you know, I, I might feel good about it. I might feel bad about it. Uh, but just saying my parents lied to me, that's a straightforward descriptive claim. So that, that's not going to be given a non-cognitivist analysis, right? Um, this is just, a, you know, bog standard belief. My parents lied to me. So I suppose, you know, one obvious way of understanding this is um, we can just understand this as this conditional as a higher order attitude towards an attitude and a belief, right? So I, I, we can we can formalize it as boo to, boo to being friendly and not believing that my parents lied to me. So this is a higher order attitude towards combining a particular attitude with a particular belief or, you know, not a belief in this case, disbelief. Um, now in principle, this is fine, right? Just as we can have attitudes towards attitudes, we can have attitudes towards beliefs and other cognitive states. Um, we can have attitudes towards combinations of attitudes and beliefs, right? There's nothing in principle problematic about that. Where this becomes a bit tricky, though, is when we consider, like, how this plays a role in, in moral arguments. So, consider the argument. If being friendly is wrong, my parents lied to me. If my parents lied to me, I can't trust anything. If being friendly is wrong, I can't trust anything. Okay, that seems fine. That's a perfectly valid argument, right? Um, we would certainly want any theory of, you know, language to account for the validity of this argument. But here we have a rather strange result. that It looks like we have to give a completely different analysis of the conditionals in, you know, premise one and premise two. So in the case of premise one, we have this higher order attitude. We have, you know, boo to boo to being friendly and not believing that my parents lied to me. But then premise two is just an ordinary indicative conditional, right? There are no moral terms. There's nothing, you know, we wouldn't give a non-cognitivist analysis of that. That is, um, you know, again, that's just an ordinary conditional. Um, so this is to be understood in ordinary cognitivist terms. Um, well, now it looks like this argument is, again, equivocating. Um, meaning is not going to be preserved over the different premises. Uh, they're actually, like, these, these premises are doing different, they're just completely different things. Um, you know, premise one is is a higher order attitude. Premise two is just ordinary, uh, an ordinary indicative conditional. Um, so this might be a problem, right? Um, that, like, although we can have attitudes towards like combinations of attitudes and beliefs it's perhaps less obvious how to extend this to cases where we you know we sort of give arguments and so on um so that might be a worry for the for the higher order attitude account all right a third objection is what we might call the objection from psychology what are we actually trying to do when we give an answer to the frege geach problem well remember that for the non-cognitivist the meaning of moral sentences is understood in terms of the attitudes those sentences are used to express. So ultimately, we're talking about states of mind. Um, now, is the higher order attitudes account plausible as an account of our mental states? <clears throat> you know, the mental states that are expressed by these complex sentences. When I, when I, so when I say, 
if stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. Do I actually hold an attitude towards a particular combination of attitudes? I think that's very questionable. I mean, okay, just in terms of my own sort of phenomenology here, there is, I have no sense at all of like attitudes towards attitudes when I'm, when I assert conditionals. I mean, I think non-cognitivism is very appealing when we're talking about atomic moral sentences. So when I judge that stealing is wrong, I do have a negative attitude. I feel the fire in my chest, as it were. But there's no similar feeling of fire with if X, then Y. You know, with if stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. Or if lying is wrong, then paying somebody to lie is wrong. That feels much more detached. Like, it's not clear to me at all that I have, like, a negative attitude towards some combination of attitudes. And, I mean, Blackburn doesn't appeal to any psychological literature in defense of his account, right? Like, so if it's the case that, you know, when we make these conditional judgments, we are expressing higher order attitudes of approval and disapproval, well, it looks like we could confirm this, right? You know, I mean, we could we could look at what's, we could, I don't know, put somebody in an MRI machine, uh, um, ask them to, and like, what conditionals they endorse, and then look at what's going on in their brain when they do so, right? That might give us some evidence in favor of this higher order attitudes account. Um, but as far as I know, Blackburn doesn't appeal to any such uh, evidence uh, in in defense, in his defense. There's another way, I think, to um, to push this kind of concern, which is which is like this. So let's just say that I'm a, a libertarian and I endorse the following claim. If stealing is wrong, then taxation is wrong. OK, so Blackburn would translate this as boo to boo to stealing and not boo to taxation. But here's the problem. It looks like, well, surely I could hold almost any attitude towards condi t towards attitudes while still endorsing this claim, if stealing is wrong, then taxation is wrong. Um, indeed, consider this, right? Given that somebody approves of taxation, I might well prefer that they also disapprove of stealing. So given that Frank approves of taxation, I might want him to disapprove of stealing. Um, now, of course, it would be better if he disapproved of both stealing and taxation. But, you know, I know that I'm never going to get him on board with disapproval of taxation. I, I know that, you know, his commitments, he, he's just never going to agree with me on that. Well, I still want him to disapprove of stealing. Um, like, that's better, right? So it looks like it would be a mistake to treat my state of mind as, you know, boo to boo to stealing and not boo to taxation. Like I, I would prefer Frank to have the state of mind boo to stealing and not boo to taxation over not boo to stealing and not boo to taxation. Indeed, I might even judge a diversity of opinion to be a, a good thing, right? Maybe I have been reading John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, and I've been persuaded that it's good for people to have uh, different beliefs to me, different attitudes to me. Um, you know, I might, so I might approve of people defending different moral views to my own, even if I would disapprove of them acting on such views, right? So, so if somebody, so like, I actually think it's good that there are people who defend taxation. It's good that there are people who defend stealing. It's good that, you know, that and, and any combination of these attitudes. I just disapprove of people acting on those attitudes, but I approve of the attitudes themselves. Um, if I'm, you know, if I'm, if I'm a, like a million, if I, if I endorse what Mill said in On Liberty, then it looks like, okay, while I disapprove of stealing, I will think it's a good thing that there are people defending stealing. And, and, and also, while I argue that if stealing is wrong, then taxation is wrong, at the same time, I want disagreement with this. Um, so, you know, hooray to boo to stealing and not boo to taxation. I mean, so this is this is the problem, right, um, is it's not entirely clear how Blackburn could account for this sort of case. But I don't think this is too unusual. I suppose one response to this problem is that, well, we have to understand the higher order attitude account in revisionary terms. So we might say, look, the higher order attitude account is not really even trying to account for the mental states that we actually have when we express conditionals. 
Um, it's, it's, you know, it's not trying to describe our actual psychologies. It's just, if our mental states were this way, then we would be able to secure, you know, validity for moral arguments. So we should favour sort of revising our moral concepts to be in line with this account. I think the obvious problem with this move, though, is that if we're, fav we're favouring revision of our moral concepts, then why wouldn't you just revise them to be cognitivist, right? The cognitivist semantics is much simpler. Um, and, then, and then you could just treat moral sentences in the same way as you treat uh, descriptive sentences. Um, so uh, that so that's perhaps an issue. Um, OK, then. So we've seen uh, the higher order attitudes account. I want to consider a very different kind of response. So with the higher order attitudes account, we're sort of um, it's it's constructive, right? Like we're, we're giving an account of the the meaning of, of like simple atomic moral sentences. And then we're showing how you can kind of then assign a meaning to conditionals. And then we're showing how, given the meaning that you've assigned to conditionals, you get, you know, validity for moral arguments and so on. So we're sort of building up from from below, as it were, you know, we're laying the foundations and then building up a theory of meaning. A very different kind of approach um, is given by uh, deflationism. A deflationist approach. So I just recently uploaded a video on deflationary theories of truth and you can check that out for more information here. But what motivates deflationism is the thought that there is no substantive property of truth. All we need in order to understand truth is to understand how the truth predicate functions and the essence of the truth predicate is the equivalence principle. Uh, P is true if and only if P. So snow is white is true just means the same thing as snow is white. Grass is green is true, just means the same thing as grass is green. That's all there is to it. Um, and in particular, a statement need not correspond to the facts or properties in the world in order to be true. You know, it's, it's not that the sentence snow is white corresponds to some state of affairs in the mind independent world. Um, it's true that snow is white, and this is because snow is white. That's it. Uh, there is, there is no particular property that all truths share, right? So they don't all share the property of correspondence to the world um, or anything like that. Again, if you want more information about deflationism, about truth, check out the video that I just recently uploaded. But the point is, if we are deflationists, then we can say that moral sentences actually do have truth conditions. Um, so I can say... Murder is wrong is true, if and only if murder is wrong. Giving to charity is good, if and only if giving to charity is good. You ought not to lie is true, if and only if you ought not to lie. Um, now, these sentences are expressions of attitudes, and they don't correspond to independent properties in the world. These sentences are not representational, but that's not required in order for them to have these minimal truth conditions. Uh, so, like, yeah, I'm, I mean, when I say murder is wrong, I'm just expressing the attitude of, like, boo to murder. But still, murder is wrong is true, if and only if murder is wrong. Um, murder is wrong doesn't need to predicate the property of wrongness of murder, and it doesn't need to be the case that uh, that there is some property in the world that murder actually has in order for murder is wrong to be true. Murder is wrong is true, if and only if murder is wrong. That's it. That is, you know, that's all that the deflationist requires. Um, so if you endorse deflationism about truth, then you can assign truth conditions to moral sentences just as easily as you can assign truth conditions to anything else. And the thought is, well, look, once we have truth conditions for atomic moral sentences, we can just apply our ordinary accounts of the meaning of more complex sentences. So the truth value of a complex sentence is a function of the truth value of its parts. Take the conditional, if P then Q. A conditional is true just in case either the antecedent is false or the consequent is true. And this is the orthodox account of the meaning of the conditional. Um, so this is, a, and this is the case regardless of what we substitute for P or Q. Um, this is just how the conditional is ordinarily understood. Um, so provided both P and Q have truth conditions, we can then understand the sentence if P then Q. And we can say, if P then Q is true, if and only if, either P is false or Q is true. 
So if we take, you know, so, so once atomic moral sentences have been assigned truth conditions, you know, if we assign some truth condition to murder is wrong, well, I say murder is wrong is true if and only if murder is wrong. Well, then I can just apply the, 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 the ordinary account of conditionals. I can say, well, if murder is wrong, then paying somebody to murder is wrong is true if and only if murder is wrong is false or paying somebody to murder is wrong is true. Um, so that is like, let's take take a moral conditional, right? We'd, if stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. We would say, if stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong is true, if and only if either stealing is wrong is false, or paying somebody to steal is wrong is true. And then these, you know, stealing is wrong is false, paying somebody to steal is wrong is true. We understand that in terms of these minimal truth conditions. So stealing is wrong is false, if and only if it is not the case that stealing is wrong. And Paying somebody to steal is wrong is true, if and only if paying somebody to steal is wrong. The minimal truth condition is the meaning of the sentence, regardless of whether the sentence is asserted or unasserted. What makes the moral sentences suitable for these sorts of uses is simply their surface grammatical form. So we saw that, you know, with, imp with imperatives, they can't take the antecedent of conditionals, right? If shut the door, then close the blinds. That's just ungrammatical. But moral sentences have the right syntax. If stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. That's perfectly well formed. And this, you know, this isn't really about the meaning of the sentence. It's not about what is expressed by the sentence. This is just to do with its surface grammar. Uh, any atomic sentence of the form X is F will have a minimal truth condition and it will be, and you'll be able to embed it in conditionals in, you know, the right kind of way. And on the deflationist view, that's all there is to say about it. Um, so essentially, the deflationary solution thinks that the frege Geach problem can be resolved by making two points. First of all, moral sentences have these minimal truth conditions, so they can be true or false. And then second, moral sentences have appropriate grammatical form. You know, moral sentences can be embedded in more complex sentences. And once you have these two points in place, we can just appeal to the orthodox accounts of the meanings of these more complex sentences. So when it comes to a conditional, if P then Q, well, we understand that as true just in case either the antecedent is false or the consequent is true. And then the moral sentences, because they have these minimal truth conditions, uh, they, can, they can act as either the antecedent or the consequent of the conditional. So... This easily explains inconsistency and in inference licensing, right? If So premise one, if stealing is wrong, then paying somebody to steal is wrong. Premise two, stealing is wrong. Conclusion, paying somebody to steal is wrong. Well, premise one is true just in case either stealing is wrong is false or paying somebody to steal is wrong is true. Premise two is true just in case uh, stealing is wrong. Premise three is true just in case paying somebody to steal is wrong. So it's clear why it would be inconsistent to accept both premises, but reject the conclusion. By accepting premise two, I take it that stealing is wrong, but then there's only one way to make premise one true, and that is to hold as well that paying somebody to steal is wrong. And, you know, we can, so we can easily see how, you know, there's like inconsistency and in how the premises license the conclusion. The main issue with this uh, response is whether we actually have an understanding of these minimal truth conditions. I mean, what the non-cognitivist says is that stealing is wrong is merely an expression of attitude, like boo to stealing, but it has this minimal truth condition in virtue of its grammatical form, right? So stealing is wrong is true if and only if stealing is wrong. And this is supposedly what's preserved when the sentence is embedded in more complex sentences. But what on earth is this? Like, what, like, what is this minimal truth condition? Um, one way to make this point clear is um, uh, so this is expressed in quite a vivid way by James Dreyer in uh, Expressivist Embeddings and Minimalist Truth, where he, he calls this the HIO problem. So he says, well, imagine that uh, there's a community that introduces the term HIO to accost people. So when you see Verity and you want to get her attention, you wave and you say, HIO Verity. So, you know, you can say HIO Verity, HIO Sydney, HIO Delia, and so on. It's basically just like the term hey or hi. Now, suppose that a convention arises where instead of saying hi-o verity, people say verity is hi-o. So when you say verity, you wave and, and you say verity is hi-o. 
So this term hi-o ends up getting used grammatically like an adjective. And again, you know, there's, I mean, this is just some convention that develops for some reason, right? When somebody says verity is hi-o, they, they are just saying the same thing as hi-o verity. It's being used in exactly the same way. Um, it's just the form, the surface grammatical form has changed. But now notice that this, this now has the right syntax to have these deflationist truth conditions. So verity is high O is true if and only if verity is high O. And of course, I mean, look, there are situations where it's appropriate to say verity is high O and situations where it's not appropriate to say verity is high O. So like sometimes I will say verity is high O, sometimes I won't, right? There are there are conditions under the appro on, on the appropriate use of that term. Um, so now it looks like given these deflationist truth conditions, I can say verity is high O is true. It's true in those cases where it's appropriate to say verity is high O. Um, moreover, verity is high O has the right syntax to be embedded in more complex sentences in just the way the way that normal indicative sentences are. For instance, if I am nearby verity, then verity is high O. Well, that's grammatically well formed. Uh, its truth value is a function of the truth value of its parts, right? It's true just in case either the antecedent is false or the consequent is true. So either I am not near, nearby verity or verity is high O. Um, on the deflationist view, that's all that's required for verity is high O to be meaningful in both asserted and unasserted contexts. This, that's all that's required for verity to for verity is high O to appear in valid arguments. I can make the argument: if I am nearby verity, then verity is high O. I am nearby verity, therefore verity is high O. But the worry is, according to Dreyer at least, well, this is just clearly the wrong answer, because if I am nearby verity, then verity is high O. I, I mean, that's just not really even intelligible. Um, it, it's also not clear what is even meant by the argument that I just outlined. Like, what would it be to infer the conclusion of that argument from its premises? Like, what would it be to infer as a conclusion a sentence that's merely used as a means of accosting people? Um, I mean, just imagine, so again, you know, we shouldn't be misled by the surface grammatical form here. When we say verity is high O, that just means exactly the same thing as something like high O verity. So it's just like saying hi to somebody. It's like hi verity, right? Imagine inferring that as the conclusion of an argument. Like what, what is that, <laughs> right? Um, like how, how, like, so when, if I'm nearby verity, then high verity. Um, I mean, obviously, yes, like the sort of situation where you would say high verity is a, is like when you're nearby verity fair enough but it's not really clear that there's like some you know like inference or, or, or like logical connection between uh these two statements um so what drea says is that deflationary truth conditions in appropriate grammatical form they're not enough to make a sentence meaningful they're not enough to account for the meanings of sentences um and so the deflationary approach is is not sufficient to to solve the Frege Geek problem, right? Like more needs to be said if we are going for a um, for a non cognitivist analysis of the meaning of moral sentences. More needs to be said um, than than what the deflationist says. Okay, then that was a an introduction to the Frege Geek problem. There's much more to say about this. It's, uh, it, as I mentioned, it's one of the biggest problems uh, in meta-ethics. Pretty much everything that's been written on non-cognitivism in, you know, the last several decades deals with the Frege Geach problem in one way or another. So um, I'm going to leave it there, and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye, everybody.